Ali is um, not only the co-founder and medical director of Orthopedic Specialist, but he's also a very good friend of mine. He's a leading up limb surgeon uh, working out of Barts and the Royal London, who is recognised around the world for his work in managing upper limb pathology. Honor and I are contemporaries. Uh, I'm really glad that we sat with each other today uh, as part of OS. And he's a fantastic hand surgeon based at the Raw Free. As you can see, he's very well trained from places, from excellent centres around the world, and he's also very heavily involved in publishing. So good to have him on. Uh, my name is Ragbear, I'm, I'm a knee surgeon. I look after the, uh, uh, the education programme, so you'll see a fair bit of me. Um, I really want to speak a little bit about Roger today. Roger is a true international superstar. He is, as I said, a world renowned um, a shoulder and elbow surgeon, probably a lot around looking after athletes, both of Olympic and world standard. A lot of the techniques that are utilised around the world are techniques that he's developed and and everyone's only really measured by their success, by the amount of procedures they do, but also how well they publish. He's also the first president of the uh, Belgian shoulder, shoulder and elbow system. So we're going to show some surface anatomy here. So this is the notch on the top, right in front of this mark here is the ACJ, posterolateral lateral corner. I've just kind of described the footprint of the supraspinatus, but let's come around the front because we're talking here today mainly about the biceps. So biceps has the long head, which goes up. If you feel the corner here, it normally comes all along here. In front of the biceps, or kind of superior to it, is the anterior leading edge of the supraspinatus. And then your subscapularis sits here. So this is subscapularis, this is supraspinatus, and there is the bicep, which goes up. There's a little funny turn here, like a 90 degree turn here. And there are structures called the biceps pulleys that keep the biceps in that place because this is an abnormal turn, right? Now that's a long head. The short head comes from the coracoid. So you'll have one head here, one head here, and that's your two heads of the biceps. So we're gonna concentrate a little bit more on the short head today. So if you look at the short head, why is it that it goes up like that and then does a little turn and keeps it there? Because clearly there's a lot of risk with it doing this little 90 degree turn because quite often in young people, the, if you're a gym bunny and so on, you, your biceps pulley, i.e. the structures that keep the biceps in place, can actually tear. So normal biceps glides up and down, but these pulleys tear, what will happen is that it'll either go that way or it'll go up that way. So it'll go this way or it'll go that way. And as you can clearly see, the risk at that stage is that the biceps, which is a nice strong tendon, can actually injure the subscapularis or can injure the supraspinatus on top. So quite often in young people, the biceps is a problem if the pulley tears and that pulley tear can cause damage to the supraspinatus up here or the subscapularis down here. It's a very, very difficult thing to notice. Quite often with a biceps pulley lesion, you may not see anything in the supraspinatus apart from a little partial tear, but the history and the examination is key to tell us if there's going to be an issue or not. Now, people often ask, why is a biceps funny shape like that? Why does it do a 90 degree turn? But actually, in most animals that we've evolved from, it doesn't, because if you're a bird, your arm is right up here, and the biceps is pretty much a straight line. Or if you are a animal that walks on your hands, right? <laughs> then again, it's very much a straight line. So having something down by the side is very much a human thing. Even monkeys and chimpanzees have their arms up here most of the time. Description of the anatomy, we're going to consider how to assess the biceps tendon. And as Ali alluded to a moment ago, you don't necessarily assess the biceps tendon itself, you assess the functionality of the entire shoulder and the functionality of where the biceps lives. Because very rarely will you actually find that the biceps tendon itself is a true source and true cause of the pain. Tendinopathy only accounts for 5% of biceps uh, pain rather than um, anything else in particular. So what's the first thing you do when you're assessing the biceps tendon or the shoulder at large is you speak to the patient. You consider the internal and external risk factors around that patient, age, work history, uh, sporting history, mechanism of injury is extremely important. 
Uh, once you've determined that, you may begin to begin to categorize uh, what this problem could be. So for example, is it a degenerative issue because you have an elderly patient who's used their shoulder quite heavily throughout their lifetime with a degenerative cuff tear leading the biceps tendon to be chronically overloaded? Do you have a tendinopathy? As I say, it accounts for only approximately 5%, but they will say that I moved house recently or I started taking up a new racket sport recently, and that could be your hint towards tendinopathy. Or do you actually have an injury to the rotator cuff, um, such as the leading edges as, as Ali uh, uh, and the pulleys as Ali alluded to? Is there an injury to those resulting in overusage of the bicep tendon and the cause of its pain? Yeah. So that's the first thing you can do when getting into And that's quite an important point. Uh, and, and the take home message from that is mm -hmm. that talking to the patient and finding out these details mm -hmm. probably gives you 50, 60% of mm -hmm. the information, Absolutely. right? And that's the key here. And examination does most of it. MRI scans and so on are just a little bit on the icing on the top. Yeah, and with regards to, and you can tell me what you think about this one, there's some controversy with regards to which uh, imaging modality is actually the gold standard or which, which investigation method is the gold standard. They even say arthroscopy is not necessarily the gold standard because you can't visualize right the way down the full Correct, and you can't tendons. see within the tendons. You can't see tendinopathies quite well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess my take on that is I get most of my information from the history. Yeah a lot from the examination, mm. and then you left with that little 10%, right? right. Um, and it's very patient specific, right? So um, if I'm suspecting a more deeper issue, like a slap tear, etc., mm. then I might do an MRI scan. Um, but if you have a bicep pulley lesion, mm. then sometimes you may need to do a dynamic exam, like an ultrasound scan to see exactly. if it's flipping in and out. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people actually tend to go for is, a, is an ultrasound scan because it's cheap and easy initially, gives you a dynamic image and it may help you begin to decide if you need to go for MRI or, or for other forms of investigation. Correct. Um, so the actual physical examination itself, you've already formulated some hypotheses in your mind. This physical examination helps you include or exclude the, those thoughts. So with the arm by the side, one of the first things you're going to do is simply look at the patient. Do they have a very poor posture? Do, were they sitting poorly in the waiting room? Is that a reflection of how they spend much of their day? So analyzing the patient's posture mm -hmm. and the times that the patients spend in these postures is extremely important because there is no bad posture. There's just a posture you spend too much time in. Mm -hmm. So Sarah stands very well. She doesn't have particularly protracted shoulders or, or a particularly kyphose thoracic spine, for example. Mm -hmm. a, a little trick is which way are their thumbs pointing? Sometimes you'll see patients standing there with very internally rotated thumbs. Have a think about what that actually does to the arm higher up. So a little small tip can be when you're walking, have your thumbs point towards the direction you want to walk in. And that <laughs> externally good. rotates the humerus and really takes some pressure off the, the, the bicep tendon right there straight away. With regards to physical examination, you're going to look at the movement of the shoulder. So if you have uh, both arms there in front and above you, as high as you can go, and repeat that several times. You're gonna to stand to the side, view that several times over, observing for quality of movement, any clicking or clunking that may be obvious, uh, any moments of pauses or moments of pain that she reports. And you're looking at scapular dynamics as well because you can have scapular dyskinesis, which may have an effect on the biceps tendon. And, and, and is symmetry is so important here, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. But asymmetry might not necessarily mean the presence of anything wrong. Asymmetry is just an observation. You need to determine if that asymmetry is a driver of your problem. Correct. Um, you're going to view from the front, from the side, and from the rear, and have the person do repeated movements, okay? One of the other repeated movements is abduction. And you can, you can really, this can be quite telling. Because when you get above 90 degrees, you're beginning to influence the space where the bicep has to operate and has to live. So you might see people judder, you might see people shake, you might see people simply pause and not be able to move any further. Correct, perfect. Great. So when we get around to the front, considering the anatomy markings that we already have, we're going to palpate the biceps tendon, okay? And get in nice and deep, feel it flick underneath your finger and ask the patient if that's painful. Because if that is painful, that's very indicative of the idea that the bicep tendon itself may be a source of your pain mm -hmm. or very, very close surrounding structures. It's actually a remarkably sensitive um, uh, test to do. Some of the other tests you can do would be O'Brien's. So O'Brien's is... It's one of my favorite tests. It's for, a very good yeah. test, yeah. But as you, as you can tell that with O'Brien's, you, you'll demonstrate this now, mm. it is a compression test, yeah. not just of the biceps, but a lot of structures around it. Absolutely. So, you, you're led by the history, mm -hmm. the age, etc. Um, 
But O'Brien's can cause pain over the ACJ, can mm -hmm. cause along the biceps at the pulley or at the slap level, mm -hmm. can be a problem with the anterior cuff. Mm -hmm. um, where the pain refers to when you're doing O'Brien's, I find it's quite actually useful. Very. Right. So would you mind demonstrating that? Yeah, sure. So with O'Brien's, you're going to ask the patient to flex their arm up to 90 degrees with 15 degrees adduction, and you're going to internally rotate the arm, okay? And you're going to ask the patient to add resistance here and you're looking for the presence of pain. So it's, a, I believe, 50s, what is it? 61% sensitive and 84% specific. Yeah. So sensitivity, not great, somewhat sensitive, but sensitive to what? Because the response is you're looking for pain, but as you just alluded to, you need to delve into that response a little bit more. Yeah. Where is the location of your pain? So if, if, so we, if we you have the arm in that position again, mm -hmm. now what's interesting that I find is that, again, not always sensitive, but a lot of times when you have pain on O'Brien's across here yeah. is usually cuff related yeah. pain. If you have pain along the line of the biceps or even sometimes in the posterior joint line, yeah. it may suggest a biceps lesion or a biceps connecting to the posterior labrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, O'Brien's can also cause, if you push hard enough, pain from a posterior labrum tear. Yeah. And that's referred exactly at the back as well. Mm -hmm. But again, when O'Brien's, you do O'Brien's, you call compression of the AC joint as well. Yeah. So where they notice the pain actually helps me figure out a little bit why the O'Brien's is positive. Yeah, so O'Brien's is, is a very important test. One of the other commonly used tests for biceps specifically is uh, biceps load two test. Yeah. So this is usually done with the patient lying down, but just for the purposes of today, it's abduction up to 120 degrees. Okay. Supination of the wrist and it's a resisted elbow flexion. Yeah. So resisted elbow flexion. And if the patient says that their pain is generated atop, uh, uh, along the length of the biceps tendon, that's quite indicative of the idea that you may have uh, pain source from the biceps tendon itself. Correct. But it's very easy to mix this up with possible slap tears as well. Yeah, okay. and again, again, it goes back to the history as well. Mm -hmm. If a patient is an is a overhead athlete okay. or a patient is in the gym and they felt I was doing something and something just went snap, mm -hmm. you know that's probably a mechanical problem. Yeah. Whereas if they were just doing a lot of biceps curls yeah. and two days later mm -hmm. the biceps was a bit sore, you're probably thinking more of tendonitis stuff, yeah, exactly. right? So the again, the, the take-home message is, you know, we get used to this, but the algorithms that our brains make in our head mm -hmm. depend a lot on the history. Uh, the history is really essential. Yeah, yeah. With the biceps load test, there's a very low sensitivity of about 30%, but it is more uh, specific to the biceps tendon itself. Other things you can do are a speeds test, for example, mm -hmm. which if, when you think about it, isn't really too dissimilar to the O'Brien's test. So Correct. if you think about the O'Brien's test for a moment, it was in this position. Correct. A modification to the O'Brien's test is into supination and ask to repeat the movement. And if you do get a repetition of pain here, you're com with the supination, you're compressing the subacromial structures a little bit less so Correct. they guide your thinking. Yeah. Uh, speeds test in this position, resistance uh, in supinated and flex your shoulder up to 90, uh, uh, your shoulder itself. So okay. that's it, yeah. And resist here and there's your resistance. Yeah. You're trying to load the biceps. So yeah. those little small nuances to test them can help guide your thought process. Yeah, exactly. And again, loading the biceps by itself is quite hard mm. and you're probably loading the biceps and maybe the surrounding structures at the level of the rotated yeah. interval with the difference between O'Brien means that you cause some active compression as well exactly. with speeds you probably don't cause the compression very similar to when you do um, bug heads thumbs up yeah. and thumbs down mm. when you do down yes it may be a little bit more posterior cuff mm. but what you're actually doing is rolling your greater tuberosity and decreasing the space exactly. and causing more impingement mm. As well. well, there's many structures there, so it's hard to be sensitive, isn't it? Correct. You're impinging many structures. Correct. Joe Gibson, a friend of mine and yours, says... We love Joe, yeah. We do. She says, poke it, compress it, and load it. And I think that's a nice little trio of things to do, a sort of mini clustering of three, trio of things to do to the bicep tendon to see if you can generate pain from that structure. Brilliant. Once you've looked closely at the shoulder, you need to take a further step back again. We did look at posture and some general movements, but if this is an overhead athlete, saying that I'm a tennis player and I get pain 20 minutes into play, you're, not, you're probably not gonna generate their pain here. Mm. You're gonna actually have to load that patient up in a way that is similar to their task, mm. to the point of where the pain begins to occur and then observe what they do. Correct, yeah. Do they have sufficient gleam-humeral joint range of motion mm. into all directions? Do they present with a gird or a geared? 
Yeah. And what are you going to do about it? Is it actually normal for them because they're throwing or an overhead athlete? And that's quite an important point as well. Sometimes, if you have lack of internal rotation, mm. you may have a very posterior tight capsule, very. and that may actually push your human head forward exactly. and result in secondary biceps pain. Exactly. In the front. And that's actually quite common too in your athletes. Correct. So yeah. once again, if we just demonstrate that, if you're a throwing athlete, you'll be uh, quite tight uh, posteriorly. So what, what you see is a forward shift of the uh, humeral head compressing the biceps tendon. Now, if you can imagine, you're, you're re repeatedly throwing, repeatedly abutting against the biceps tendon. That can be the source of your pain and discomfort. Now, some manual therapy can be really useful there and mm. having the patient do some stretches, such as, say, sleeper stretch and whatnot. But more importantly, have you assessed the thoracic spine also as well? If the thoracic spine does not have the ability to rotate, so if you cross your arms across your body, Sarah, I would do this in seating to take the legs out of it, and, and ask Sarah to rotate one direction versus the other, and see if there's any rotational deficits in the thoracic spine. Mm. What does a throwing athlete do? As I often joke, you don't see Roger Federer serve a tennis ball like this. He uses his entire body. Correct. And if we don't have the ability to rotate, through our thoracic spine, use our hips, be able to control our kinetic chain right the way from the ground all the way through to the hand where the, where the energy is exiting. Something is going to be overworked and you often find that is the shoulder. So if someone is rotationally stiff in the thoracic spine, for example, they will try and rotate more through the shoulder to have a greater arc of movement to generate power. Correct. Um, so you must take a step back and look at their task fatigue them and then see what they do in order to see if you can expose the true driver behind their problem. Because as we said, it's very often not the biceps tendon itself, it's how the biceps tendon is being treated. Correct. So biceps is often uh, a problem because it's been mistreated by other people. Yeah. yeah. And then the biceps itself mistreats the rotator cuff. Exactly. So there's always a war going on between the biceps and the other structures. Hi, my name is Roger van Riet, and I'm uh, happy to share my thoughts on biceps tendon ruptures with you. I'm a designer with Acumet, and I'm also a designer of the uh, Exo Elbow Splint by Jake Design that we use post-operatively. This talk will be uh, in three parts. First, we'll talk about the general aspects of distal biceps tendon pathology, then the clinical exam, and then finally the treatment. So we know that the distal biceps has uh, uh, attaches to the radius. We know that the biceps itself has two heads, uh, very distinct in the shoulder, less distinct in the elbow, but still uh, in 60%, there is a difference between the short and the long head. So basically two tendons, although they look as one. Then there's the lacertus fibrosis, fibrotic band, which runs from the biceps tendon to the uh, fascia of the flexor muscles. And it probably centers the biceps tendon, so it does have a function in the in the, uh, biceps tendon biomechanics. And then a nice side effect: it can prevent retraction in complete tears. And this is one patient that had a chronic tear, so um, uh, I think uh, seven or eight months later, but only a retraction of one and a half centimeters. And uh, that may be the reason why it was misdiagnosed initially. We found a ruptured biceps in clinic uh, in surgery and an intact assertus, which prevented retraction. So the function of the biceps, elbow flexion, forearm supination, very important, and it has an aesthetic function as well. And in some people, this is the most important function of this uh, biceps tendon. And when it ruptures, they're very disappointed and uh, want to have it fixed. I told you in 60% of patients, there is, or of people, there's a difference between the short head and the long head. And the short head is maybe more important in flexion, whereas the long head may be more important for supination. Pathology of the distal biceps tendon can include bursitis, tendinopathy, and a rupture. And the rupture can be partial or complete. And complete ruptures comprise about 3% of all tendon injuries in the upper extremity. Predisposing factors are smoking, anabolic steroid use or abuse, uh, tuberosity spur. And we're not sure which is the chicken or the egg, so maybe the tuberosity spur uh, arises from distal tendon pathology, or maybe the pathology uh, comes from the, uh, from the spur. We don't know what's first. And then very often there are previous symptoms, so patients will already have had some problems at the anterior part of the elbow before the tendon actually ruptures. Complete biceps structure occur in 1.2 per 100,000 middle-aged men, dominant arm in 85, and an eccentric loading will rupture the biceps tendon. It's often not very painful. It can actually be pain-free, 
uh, especially if uh, patients have used or abused uh, uh, substances that decrease the strength of the uh, biceps tendon insertion. So how do we diagnose this biceps tendon ruptures? The diagnosis is clinical. Clinical exam is the most important part, especially in complete ruptures and also in, in um, a partial rupture. We'll go over this in a second. Imaging, important partial ruptures, not so much in the complete ruptures. And then you can even do endoscopy just to look at the extent of the rupture. This is a difficult one, bursitis, tendinosis, partial rupture, uh, part of the same pathology. Uh, basically, it's a spectrum of pathology, I guess, and um, important because it does make a difference in uh, treatment. Diagnosis of partial tear is quite difficult. Uh, they're painful, but this is aspecific, so pain can be caused by other uh, problems as well. Patients may be weak, but that could be due to pain, again, caused by other problems as well. So very aspecific. Ultrasound and MRI often not conclusive. Uh, and a clinical exam um, um, may be difficult. And only three tests have been described. Firstly, the TILT test, that was the first test that had been described in clinical anatomy in 2018. They described three cases in a descriptive study, uh, and they said that um, when you palpate the tuberosity in supination, it's less painful than when you pronate, it becomes more painful, and that's the TILT set test. So like I said, uh, three cases and uh, uh, no data on uh, specificity or sensitivity. Resistant hook test was presented at, at the European Society in 2020. Uh, 45 complete tears, 21 patients with a partial tear. So basically, this is about those 21 patients. Six had an abnormal hook test, and we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, in the hook test, you supinate the forearm, you ask patients to look at their own arm, look at their own hand, and then you hook behind the biceps tendon. And once you hook behind it, um, it can be normal with nice, nice tension on it, or abnormal in, in six of these where there was laxity on the hook test when compared to the other side. Um, 15 had an abnormal resisted hook test. So what they did was they resisted supination and, and uh, performed a hook test with resisted supination. And in their series, they found a sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 98%. So in their, at least in their hands, a very good uh, sign. We came up with the distal biceps provocation test. It's a two-part test. The elbow is held in about 70 degrees of flexion. The hand of the examiner is on the forearm. That's very important because the hand of the patient has to be relaxed. Um, so you don't use any other muscles than the biceps tendon. And then you resist flexion with the forearm supinated. Then you pronate the forearm and resist flexion again. And our hypothesis was that when you perform this test in supination, it will be less painful than it is in pronation. Ralph is, uh, is my son, uh, so this is not a, a technical term. Ralph uh, made these drawings for me, and uh, he showed us that when you supinate it on the left, the green area is not in, in uh, contact with the tuberosity, whereas when you pronate exactly the same patient, the, green, the red area now is in contact with the uh, tuberosity, and there's compression on the pathological tissue. These are two endoscopic views, so we went inside, looked, looked at the tendon with the camera, and this is the same patient on the left, in supination, so you see the pathological tissue, which is not in contact with the uh, tuberosity at this point. And on the right, you see the pathological tissue, which is hidden away the tuberosity and can be compressed when the patients would, uh, would contract their biceps. So we did a study on this, and uh, we asked uh, those patients to um, perform the distal biceps provocation test. We had 30 patients with distal biceps pathology and 30 patients with other pathologies such as tennis elbow or, or a PIN compression or other nerve problems. Distal biceps test in a provocation test in supination had an average FAST score of one, so not very painful, sometimes not painful at all. Um, whereas the distal biceps provocation test in pronation had an average FAST score of seven, and this was highly significant. But the distal biceps test in pronation was always in all patients more painful than the one in supination. And again, that was uh, significant. When we looked at patients without distal biceps tendon pathology, so tennis elbows, uh, on the nerve, etc., we found that the distal biceps provocation test in pronation was never more painful than in supination. And as you can see, uh, resistive flexion was uh, not painful in, in the majority of patients without distal biceps tendon pathology. So in, at least in this small series, we found a sensitivity and specificity of 100%. But we've repeated this, and uh, uh, luckily, uh, no test is uh, perfect. 
So what we did was we looked at the tilt sign, the resistant hook uh, test, and the distal bicep provocation test in 40 patients with distal bicep tendon pathology and 40 with other pathology. And we found that, uh, again, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of the distal bicep provocation test were uh, much better than, than the tilt sign. That was significant. And were better than the, hook sign, than the resistant hook sign, although that was not significant. And what we uh, do now is we perform both the resistant hook sign and the distal provocation test. And uh, when we combine both, we get an accuracy of about 100%. So uh, resistant hook and distal bicep provocation sign for um, uh, distal biceps, partial ruptures, uh, tendinosis, or bursitis. So when we exam examine the uh, distal biceps, when we examine the distal biceps uh, complete tears, we find a different uh, uh, clinical exam. You can see here, first of all, the patient knows. That's important. So the patient knows something tore, and they might have felt a pop, they, but they, they know something has happened. You see here, this is the Popeye sign. You see how the uh, biceps muscle has uh, retracted approximately. So the distal biceps has ruptured, distal biceps tendon has ruptured, and the biceps muscle was pulled up uh, very often during the same movement. <clears throat> Resistive flexion is usually not painful in complete tears and might still be very strong because of the brachialis. Same with resistive supination maybe a little bit less uh, strong, um, but the supinator takes over some of the uh, of the function. And then there's the hook test, the rotation sign, which is this patient I'll show you again. So what we do is we rotate the forearm and you see how the, the muscle belly does not move, whereas in an intact biceps tendon, uh, the muscle belly will move up and down. Then there's the squeeze test, uh, analogous to the um, Thompson sign, analogous to the Thompson sign in the, um, Achilles tendon ruptures, so you squeeze the muscle belly and the forearm will rotate. And then there's finally the lag sign. Some patients may not be able to flex fully. So he knows, he knows. Immediately they know something has happened. Uh, this patient was happy to share his uh, images. He actually shared it himself on YouTube. So this is, a, this is one that's uh, straight out of YouTube. So because of that swelling, sometimes you don't see the, uh, the Popeye sign that well. So proximal retraction of the muscle belly, positive rotation sign. The supinator forearm, and that's really no tendon in this patient. So is this a flexion not very painful? Is this a supination? Not very painful, and obviously this guy is uh, very, very strong. And arrive Fab's view, which means flexion, abduction, supination is a special view on the, uh, uh, you know, basically a special position for the patient, and you get the, the view on the right. So you can actually follow the distal biceps tendon all the way from the tuberosity to the uh, best, uh, biceps muscle. Although the uh, fans view had been uh, published years before, uh, no one really looked at uh, at accuracy or uh, sensitivity of the of the fab view. So what we did was we had 50 patients with distal biceps tendon pathology, 25 we did a fab view, 25 we did the normal Superman view, which is uh, with the arm straight up, also a patient in prone, and then uh, 50 other pathologies again, flexion, abduction, supination view in 25, and Superman view in 25. And our radiologists were blinded to uh, to what we thought was the problem. So we asked them to grade it. We asked them to look if, if there was pathology and we asked them then to grade the pathology. And there was actually no difference between uh, uh, the Superman view and the FAB view in uh, finding pathology. So uh, uh, as sensitive for distal biceps pathology. However, when we asked them to grade it, that was significantly improved. That, that was significantly improved with the FAB view. So FAB view MRI sensitivity specificity about 80%, a little bit more than 80% standard MRI sensitive to specificity, not too bad. So uh, you could combine both views again, no significant difference between the view. However, FAB view was more reliable. We had two radiologists looking at these and it was more reliable uh, with 92% inter-rate of reliability versus 68 for the standard view. And then the control group, uh, they were similar. So uh, no, no um, significant differences. So conclusion of this segment, Biceps tendon pathology, partial tears, 
bursitis, tendinosis, or glandular group, uh, and complete tears are possible. Clinical diagnosis, distal biceps provocation test with or without resistant hook test, definitely the hook test in uh, uh, complete tears and a rotation sign. Imaging becomes more important in partial tear because complete tear is really, really a clinical diagnosis. Uh, you can do ultrasound in uh, partial in the complete tears, but we tend not to do an MRI because it often delays uh, treatment, and uh, we prefer to have early treatment in. So what we try to say with the imaging with the imaging talk is, is basically imaging for total ruptures is not really necessary. We do ultrasound just to objectify and to tell uh, uh, the patient, listen, see, this, this has been ruptured, so this needs to be fixed. But it's a clinical diagnosis, so the, the next part of the presentation, or the next video is much more important. Um, many, many radiologists say that there's a muscular tenderness there, so as soon as they do an ultrasound, they see some blood uh, at, the, at, the, at the biceps because the biceps tendon curls up and sort of ends up here at around the muscle, muscle belly. And then... Um, when it's at the muscle belly, there's some blood there, and they think it's a muscular tendon tear, but it never is. It is always a distal biceps tendon tear, and uh, and that's what you find with your uh, with your clinical exam. That's why the clinical exam is so important. Let's go to the treatment options uh, for distal biceps tendon ruptures. Conservative treatment, yes. Partial tears, definitely conservative treatment. We rest them. We uh, give them a non anti-inflammatory, um, physio eccentric exercises, stretching, etc. Uh, you can uh, you can offer them an injection. We prefer not to inject cortisone uh, because this might weaken the tendon and might even um, <clears throat> provoke a, uh, a complete rupture. So we prefer to use uh, things like PRP. It's important to do this under ultrasound guidance because uh, applying the injection, first of all, may be dangerous with the neurovascular structures very close by, but also it's going to be very difficult to really inject into the bursa without uh, any uh, imaging guidance. We do this minimum six months, obviously, unless there's a very, very high grade rupture. And that's um, where we get the fab shoe MRI. And you can see if there's a very high grade rupture, that chances of this working are not very big. Um, if there's a low grade rupture, definitely you do a minimum of six months. And then I, I still tell the patients, listen, it's not um, necessary to fix this. However, the chances of it healing decrease uh, greatly after six months. And if they do rupture completely, well, then please contact me as soon as possible because that we, we try to do it within a few weeks. If conservative treatment fails, um, the treatment of uh, partial tears, again, conservative, but that failed, uh, then surgery becomes an option, either endosco endoscopy or open. In complete ruptures, again, uh, we prefer to perform surgery as soon as possible or at least within a couple of weeks. And again, that can be done endoscopically or open. What do we do with endoscopy? With endoscopy, we go inside with the camera, and as you can see on, this, on the schematic uh, drawing on the left, the uh, scope is between the tendon and the uh, bone into the bursa, and that's the image that you get. There's definitely advantages. You get a magnified view, and you don't have to pull on the tendon. So that tendon is already pathological, and you avoid pulling on it by just putting the camera in. I actually like it as well because uh, patients usually are awake during this surgery and they can actually have a look at, uh, at their uh, pathology. We did a study um, on this as well in, in uh, cadaveric uh, specimens. This is actually uh, a video from uh, one of those uh, cadaveric specimens, not an actual patient. Um, so avoid pulling on a pathological tendon. Um, we saw that tunnel placement is equal to direct view. It's accurate and reproducible, and it can be done safely. So there was no difference between endoscopic, uh, endoscopic tunnel uh, creation and, uh, and open uh, when, with regards to the, to the posterior androsis nerve or the arteries. So risks involved with this surgery are not specific to endoscopy. So what do we see with endoscopy? We can look at the tendon. Um, at, the, at the left here, you see the bursa. At the bottom is the tendon. At the, uh, at the top, you see the bone. That's the tuberosity itself. And you can actually look at both borders. This is a very uh, pathological tendon. You see there's the tuberosity with those osteophytes that I talked about before. And the tendon at the bottom is a uh, you know, very high-grade uh, uh, problem. So what we do when we when we see these uh, problems, we go from birth size tendon or partial tear. If there's less than 25% of the problem, we debride the pathological tissue. If it's up to 50%, we debride and uh, repair it with an anchor. And if it's more than that, 
or if it's less than 50, but the rest of the tendon looks pretty awful as well, we detach it and reinsert it with an endobutton. And this is the actual tech, uh, video of the actual technique. Um, so the patient is supine, the arm on the arm table. Usually we use a block, so patients are awake and uh, are actually looking at the images themselves. We determine the elbow crease, and then we, may, we palpate the biceps tendon, which is possible because these are partial tears. I don't like using this technique for open tears, although, uh, for, sorry, for complete tears, even though you can, but um, it adds a little bit of complexity, whereas most of the, of the uh, surgery is done mini open anyway. This lateral anterobrachial cutaneous nerve, so many of these patients have temporary numbness in the forearm. Um, we used to have up to 30% of temporary numbness when we looked for that nerve. So this is an older video when we when we actually looked and protect, looked at the nerve um, and protected it during surgery. Now we don't look at it anymore. So we leave it in its in its place. I know where it is because of all the uh, surgeries we did before. And now it's very rare for us to have a, uh, a numbness of the forearm. So we have a normal scope that's used for knee arthroscopy as well. And uh, we look at the, uh, we, we enter the bursa. So we're between the bone and the bursa. We don't use a lot of fluid, but if we use fluid, it freely flows and it, uh, it basically um, exits that portal that we made. Create the same portal for open surgery as we do for endoscopic surgery. Um, because what we found in that uh, cadaveric study that we did is if we start working, so if you start using shavers and, and burrs, et cetera, it's better to use uh, big retract. So, uh, uh, we still prefer to use that that uh, incision that's only two centimeters, so it's similar to uh, to open the skull. So this was a person with an inflamed bursa, where we uh, just re um, resected that bursa and uh, then let the patients uh, um, heal again. There might be a small tendon problem there distally, but um, really no problem. So partial tears up to 25 percent. Um, you can see this on an MRI. This is a fab view again. You can see here, there's a very small defect on that tendon at the bottom, whereas you have the tuberosity at the top. So you can deprive that and leave it alone. 25 to 50%. This patient didn't come with the fab view, so we didn't repeat it uh, because it was clear that there was a, a distal bicep tendon rupture. And, and so we just um, basically created the injury endoscopically. When you pronate the forearm is very difficult to see. When you supinate the forearm, you see the the uh, the problem on the on the tendon, and then you can just debride it with a uh, with a little uh, shaver. Make sure you stay between the bone and the tendon. That's very important, uh, obviously, because the uh, neurovascular structures at the anterior part of the forearm. So we thought that the rest of the tendon was still uh, pretty good, and um, we ended up. Uh, repairing this one with an anchor. So you can drill the anchor as a sleeve so the drill doesn't catch any of the soft tissues. Check it, make sure that it's strong, fix it, and then inspect the result. That's pretty straightforward and, and we feel that we have a strong repair here. 25 to 50% again in a fab view. This tendon looks a little bit worse, but you can see that part of the tendon is definitely still intact. Um, And we do exactly the same. So deep right, every once in a while you'll see my retractors as well. So we use landing back retractors to retract the neurovascular structures away from our uh, from our shavers and our instruments. In these cases, we use the uh, all suture anchor. That's the uh, that's the anchor part. So you push that in, and then when you pull, it becomes a little ball, and it's really really uh, tight. So this is extremely strong although it's only 1.4 millimeter drill hole. So you suture the tendon. Down there, you see my retractor. You tie the knot open or endoscopically, the, whatever you prefer. And I think uh, shoulder surgeons definitely uh, prefer to do this, whereas hand surgeons might want to do this, uh, this uh, one mini open without endoscopic view. And then you can put the endoscope back in to check the results after you've, after you've uh, uh, fixed this. That's relatively straightforward. However, it takes a long, long time to heal. And where we have uh, patients with uh, with very bad tendons like this one, where we perform a, um, a detachment and a, re and a reinsertion with an endobutton, um, they are actually very quick with healing and they uh, tend to um, be quite strong in a couple of months. 
are those patients where we do a partial debridement and a reinsertion or just a debridement on themselves. They take up to three to six months to heal and uh, um, they take quite a long time. But we still sometimes prefer to have, to have their own tissue. It's more anatomic, obviously. And um, so uh, we discuss it with the patient depending on what they want. So after 2018, we're quite a bit further now where we looked up our results. We did 59 endoscopies, uh, only 12% had a debridement, 20% had a uh, had a reinsertion with an anchor, and in 40, we uh, went ahead and did a, an endobutton reconstruction anyway. We had no permanent complications in those patients. Post-op, we do protect them. Like I said, we use an exosplint uh, for two weeks, uh, full range of motion at six weeks. We aim for full range of motion at six weeks for sure, and we load them at three months and 5% uh, uh, in our series failed and we had a late conversion to a uh, to end the button. So this patient, uh, patient from before, similar incision, slightly bigger because it's a bigger guy. Flex it up, make a small incision distal to the elbow crease, flex it up and find the elbow, uh, the tendon. There it is. So that's a very important comment because in these big guys, sometimes um, you find a very poor quality of tendon, but, but uh, his tendon was perfect. So uh, this was really just mechanical because he, uh, as you saw earlier, he did a, what he called a lazy hook and an eccentric loading, which is so much that the tendon just failed. So not because of uh, previous pathology or abuse. So there you go, the end of button is uh, 12 millimeters by four millimeters. And um, it's a very simple end of button, it's cheap. It's uh, the one without the loop because the loop is, uh, is the expensive part in this system. I don't use any other screws. I don't use any, any, uh, anything else. So for about 30 pounds, I think you're uh, with set. Two sutures, the bright, the, um, the distal uh, part of the tendon. Make sure not to cut your own switches. That happens every once in a while, and you have to do it again. And especially when we're filming, I'm extra careful, of course. So there's the tendon fixed to the end of button. Put this out of the way, and then we drill our uh, pilot hole with the guide. It's very important because central topic classification is definitely a complication that's very common. Remove that bone, rinse, copious rinsing, and this arm is hypersupinated. That's important. So hypersupinated to get the posterior interosseous nerve out of the way. So then feed the um, feed the sutures through the uh, guide pin. Pull them through to the other side. Then choose one. So we have white and we have uh, uh, striped sutures. Choose one of those. We, I tend to. I usually look at the uh, at the button and see which one wants to go. Pull them through the bone. So shuttle them through the tunnel and through the second cortex. And once you're through, pull on the other one and it flips. And then it's stuck. We do do an X-ray just for us to be quickly to make sure that it's on the right side and uh, to make sure that it flipped correctly. It's not in the in the medullary. That's it. So end buttons are allowed to lift 20 kilos from day one. They don't do it, but they're allowed to lift 20 kilos from day one. They have full range of motion usually after a week or two. And then this is, uh, sorry for the noise, 
this is then exposed up and uh, just to show you that we uh, they're not they're not that great but we allow them to do uh, basically whatever they want and up until 20 kilos so in conclusion birth sites tendonitis uh, partial tears to the antwerp biceps test what we used to call them distal biceps provocation test now um, do a fat mri conservative treatment for a minimum of six months and if it fails, biceps endoscopy, deep right repair or reinsert, whereas with full ruptures, complete ruptures, we uh, just go for an early reinsertion. So what happens if the, if the diagnosis is missed or when the patients um, um, present delayed? This is Dr. Mori. He's the, uh, the guru of elbow surgery. He's retired now, but repair and hyperflexion is possible. He showed us this in 2014, and he said grafting is rare, and even in chronic cases, you can still repair them. So we are about to do a uh, right um, biceps reconstruction. Uh, this is seven months down the line, more than seven, eight months down the line. And, and this is one of the worst ones, actually. The muscle is here, right? So we know the muscle bulk should be right down here, but you try to all the way up here. And you can see the biceps down here. The muscle actually looks pretty good. It looks fairly mobile here. And we're not doing this actively, and you'll see it contract. But it's not physically connected to anything. There's nothing down here. This is a gentleman who had a biceps tendon rupture, but it happened uh, over six months ago. So what we've done is we've prepared our um, attachment site here, so that's all ready to go. We've then done a, we've done an exploration around the biceps tendon, so it was very much scarred down. We released it from the uh, muscular cutaneous nerve, the median nerve, the artery on the inside, brachial artery. We have found some tendon remnants. Um, part of it was the lacertus, um, and a lot of the tendon is up here. But what we've done is we've created, um, uh, uh, recreated the tendon. We've done one stage of the uh, suture graft, uh, suturing uh, this stage. So hopefully we'll be able to mobilize this and reattach it down there. It might be that we need to flex the elbow up and then stre stretch him out slowly over time. Okay. Okay. So we've um, uh, passed the tendon through the radius, through the tuberosity. We've created a tunnel and passed it through. Suture's exited through here. And we've got good tension in the muscle. He's comfortably reaching to 90 degrees. Just a little bit of tension. But to relax in the muscle, he can, he can extend a little bit more. This will relax over time, some physiotherapy. Uh, but ultimately, at the moment, really nice, strong, really nice, strong repair, holding, holding, holding well. Four weeks post-op and see how good he is already. And uh, we're expecting a full uh, recovery of range of motion. Uh, we didn't stress him because we uh, we also want the tendon to heal, of course. And as you heard uh, Ona say, we used the, the remnants of the uh, lacerative fibrosis to reinforce that, that tendon stump that was still there. So this is uh, Dr. Mori's um, uh, data and uh, showed that reconstruction was similar. Uh, 16, 19 patients with the graft, 16 patients with delayed repair, and uh, very similar, slightly worse with reconstruction, but there's a big bias there because uh, uh, if the tendon is really rubbish, like in this one, you might need to do something. And sometimes you only find a little, little tiny stump, but even in hyperflexion, you can't fix it. Well, then you can choose your grafts. You can use ultragrafts such as palmaris, the lesser just like we used in, uh, in the previous patient, although that was more of a re, uh, reinforcement, not necessarily graft. Uh, triceps can be used, uh, hamstrings, and then allograft extends hallucis longus, Achilles tendon, which is the, has become the gold standard. Uh, dermal grafts have been used in tibial anterior. So, uh, uh, Jordi Fatnes uh, showed uh, significant improvement in uh, 21 patients where, the, where um, Achilles tendon graft was used, and uh, this has become, really become the gold standard over time. This is what it looks like, so it's big, big surgery to do a graft. Um, we now do a two-stage incision like we did in, uh, in that patient that I showed you. So this is a 40-year-old male athletic trainer. Um, distal bicep tendon rupture in January 2019. Uh, someone attempted a repair, and, and um, according to the notes, it was 12-hour surgery. I'm not sure why. Uh, they uh, created maybe a vascular injury and had to fix that. I'm, I really don't know. Um, and then finally, they removed the stump. So there was no bicep tendon left, and they switched to brachialis. And he had ongoing pain and weakness four months post-op, and he was really painful and really weak. This was a case that we did in uh, in uh, in Antwerp in Belgium. It was before I was actually working in in, uh, in the UK. So find the bicep muscle. Um, this is the radial nerve. Unfortunately, with uh, surgery like this, all nerves are in danger, as the median nerve. 
Um, that was, we, we weren't looking for a bias within a stunt because basically they, they removed that according to the notes. Um, there was a little bit left maybe, but that was definitely not, uh, not very good. So we, we ended up tracing this all the way up and we, uh, we did have a little bit of length. Um, not perfect as you can see, but a little bit of length. Prepared to rosti exactly the same as what we do with the, with the smaller incision. So there's the bone. Um, rotate the forearm a few times, and then you can feel whether to rosti is. If you're not sure, use um, use to a fluoroscopy to make sure it's in the right spot. There's the Achilles tendon. The, the bone has already been removed. Nine millimeter in this case, because our Achilles tendon was a little bit bigger than the, than a normal biceps tendon. Drill the first hole. Drill the second hole. I always ask my fellows and residents and registrars why we do this order, because we have to do this order, and that's because as soon as you drill the second cortex, the guide pin becomes unstable. So it even comes with, but, but um, um, if you drill the four and a half millimeters, then the guide pin becomes unstable, and it's very difficult to drill the big one for the first cortex. You drill the first cortex first, and then the second cortex. Remove the excess bone, start rinsing, rinsing, rinsing to make sure, or at least decrease the... Uh, chances of heterotopic classification. We use the, the actual uh, tendon or whatever that we, uh, that we found earlier on, and we suture this into a, into a nice tube. And it's important to have a little bit of a tendon stump because if you only suture the muscle, uh, it's not very strong. So the muscle itself, suturing it muscle to muscle or muscle to other graft in this case, is not very strong. We do suture it because we want to avoid creating a, um, a room behind the ten behind this Achilles tendon and between the muscle because we don't want to have a seroma or anything uh, like that later on. And there's the bone button and the, the rest of it is uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same as what we do with an open uh, repair. We can see with the length of that Achilles tendon, uh, this is not going to be a, a normal arm. So that biceps muscle, we can't, we can't get it down completely in this patient. Uh, probably because they sutured it to the brachialis uh, I don't want to reset too much. I don't want to dis dissect too much because we uh, we will end up in the brachial artery as well. So that's uh, this is a very relatively risky surgery. A strong repair, remove the excess uh, um, Achilles tendon. There's your button. This looks exactly the same as what we do open, except for the fact that it's a little bit bigger, so it's a little bit more bulky, and that's why we. We drilled uh, a slightly bigger hole in the two crust. So again, hyper supinate. Supinate as hard as, as much as you can when you're uh, putting that pin through, not only for the pin, but for the button as well afterwards. So keep it supinated uh, while you're doing this. So feed, feed the suture through. There you go, and it's exactly the same as what we do with the, with the primary, except for the uh, allograft. I had to pull quite hard on this one because uh, because of the bulkiness of the uh, of the graft, and then you pull on the other one, flip the button. There you go. In this case, we have direct view, but we still do a, a fluoroscopy to make sure it's in a correct position. It takes ten seconds and it um, helps you sleep better at night. So quite strong, good fixation. A big surgery can be avoided if you uh, get to the patient soon. And uh, in this case, unfortunately, um, uh, they he was uh, picked up early, but uh, but um, the fixation was, was let's say suboptimal. So, in conclusion, this delayed presentation, we prefer to repair in hyperflexion, re reconstruct with an allograft. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, so, it's going to be ten minutes yes. to go through slabs and proximal biceps. Um, so I'm Ali Nirani, um, obviously part of the OS group, but also work at the Royal London Hospital uh, for my NHS practice. Um, quickly going through the anatomy from the proximal biceps. Biceps, obviously Latin for two heads. We are not talking about the short head today. We're talking about the long head. And it's interesting that the biceps actually is um, um, a tendon that is very close to my heart in the shoulder, right? It causes a lot of trouble. Um, 
But as you can see, the Ashley bicep starts in the intra-articular. It starts on the top of the glenoid, is actually same as the superior labrum. So superior labrum and the biceps anchor is exactly the same. And there is a bit of an intra-articular portion. Then it does a little curve around, bends around the corner, and then goes out of the shoulder. Um, and most commonly, the proximal pathology is uh, more commonly in men, uh, mostly around 40 to 60 year olds. We do tend to see a lot of younger patients around London, especially the ones that do a lot of lifting. And it either can be an overuse or a sudden acute injury. Um, isolated biases pathology actually is very, very uncommon. So one of the important take home messages that the biceps pathology proximally is actually something that exists with other problems, right? So quite commonly subscapularis tears or instability of the biceps pulley causing issues with the subscapularis. Uh, quite often associated with other parts of the rotator cuff, for example, supraspinatus, where a biceps can cause inflammation of the supraspinatus or result in tears of the supraspinatus. And I'll explain a bit more bit later on how that works. Uh, slab tears, for example, can be associated with instability of the glenoidal joint, if they, especially if they extend to the posterior or the anterior labrum. And of course, biceps can be inflamed in either rotator cuff arthropathy or glenohumeral joint arthritis. This is an important slide because it tells us why the biceps cause trouble to the rest of the shoulder. Now, if you look at the biceps and you look at that very acute 90 degree turn it does, that is really abnormal, right? But we are abnormal as human beings because a lot of people have biceps in the animal world. They're either birds and they're flying and their arms are up here and the biceps is pretty much straight or they're animals on all fours and the biceps is actually pretty much in a straight line to where it attaches. But our arms here down by the side, the biceps comes out, does a 90 degree bend and to avoid it from slipping out, there are lots of complex structures called pulleys to keep the biceps in place. So a biceps by itself often doesn't cause a lot of issues in the shoulder. But a biceps that becomes unstable, inflamed, or comes out of the pulley, tears through the pulley, actually can compromise the rotator cuff. So you can see the subscapularis is sitting right there. So if a bicep slips out, it can inferiorly go and tear the subscapularis. But quite often what we'll see in the gym, guys, is like saying, I was bench pressing, and my arms are up here, and suddenly, um, I felt something go. The biceps actually goes backwards and cuts into the anterior leading edge of the supraspinatus. So very uncommon to see isolated long hair of the biceps pathology. But when you're look, talking about biceps, you're looking at the rotator cuff issues and you're looking at glenohumeral joint instability issues. So yes, there are less common pathologies like groove pain from a you know, biceps tendon by itself. You can have weird and wonderful bifurcated long headed bicep tendons, hourglass deformities, but these are less common. History and examination is the key here, just like it was in the elbow, right? Listening to the patient and telling them how the pain started is the most important thing that I get from figuring out if it's a biceps problem or not. And yes, there's a lots of different tests that you can do, uh, and we may not have time to go through them, but they are tests that we have done before when we did the APCD of shoulders and the lectures available online. For palpating the groove, there may be pain, but specific biceps tests don't really matter. You've got to examine the cuff, you've got to examine for glenoidal joint instability. That's where the problem lies with the biceps. Ultrasound is useful, especially if you are suspecting the biceps pulley lesion to see if his biceps is subluxing or not. An MRI scan, of course, will tell you about everything else in the shoulder. But I can tell you that for the proximal biceps, MRI scan in isolation is not that useful. Because imagine a situation where you see a slap tear. There are lots and lots of people who have slap tears of the MRI scan and is not the source of the problem. So if you have a slap tear and there is a, a problem with the biceps on imaging, it may not be the problem of the patient. Question may present with something completely different. Similarly, it can go the other way around as well. There are plenty of patients that I see that actually have maybe a little partial tear of the anterior leading edge of the supraspinatus, right? And they have a lot of tendinopathy of the cuff. 
And somebody might say, it's a small partial tear of the cuff, ignore it. But what they've actually missed on the examination and what they've missed on the history is that biceps is unstable. And what it's actually doing is flicking back and forth. An MRI scan being a non-dynamic scan, they actually haven't picked that up, but you can easily pick that up quite clinically. And unfortunately, that is a progressive lesion. So if you have a biceps that is flicking back and forth, they can actually cheese wire through the rotator cuff tendons. So when you want to deal with biceps proximally, the key is don't worry about the biceps, you've got to protect the rotator cuff. So most problems with biceps are non-operative problems. But there are certain things that we need to think about whether we need to act. For example, slap tears, mostly on non-operative, arthritis of the glenomal joint, rotator cuff arthropathy, there are lots of good solutions, and the biceps may be inflamed, but often can be treated non-operatively. But there are certain things that we do worry about. Right? So if you have a small partial subscapularis tear and the biceps is unstable, that is not going to go away. Okay, So don't ignore that MRI report that says subscapularis tendinopathy or a partial tear, right? because that is usually a big pro bigger problem than you expect. Because subscapularis tears are very, very difficult to happen on the isolation, and it usually happens in somebody who has biceps instability. And quite often only picked up on and history and examination rather than MRI scan. Sharif, any comments on that? Yeah, no, definitely. Someone once described a uh, leading edge tear to uh, subscap or supraspinatus as the beginning of peeling back the curtains. Um, it was me. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> a stitch in time saves nine, as they say. So it's one of those things where, from my experience interacting with different surgeons over the years, that getting ahead of the problem even surgically actually does make an element of sense otherwise you will continue to peel back the footprint off that ro uh, rotator cuff and um, it'll be a much bigger problem later down the line and if that biceps is unstable it will only serve to peel back those curtains even quicker correct you don't care about a curtain when you lose one or two hooks in the middle or lots of hooks in the middle but if you have hooks on the end that are gone it actually is a problem um, so the next question that people often ask is when you have a slap and if it's pathological, right, when do you actually repair a slap and when would you actually go on and do a tenodesis? And the take home message on that is, I mean, you can go into a lot of details on this, but take home message on that is there is an age that people find that over th under 30 years old, you can just fix a slap in isolation. If it's over 30 year old, do a tenodesis. But age has probably got nothing to do with it. Actually, what it has got to do with is that younger people tend to have slap tears with glenohumeral joint instability as part of a labor issue, and they don't have a cuff problem. Whereas if, as when you get older, you probably have a more of a degenerative slab, which is actually causing more of a cuff pathology. So once again, the treatment is that if you're slightly older and you're worried about the cuff, you got to make sure you get the biceps out of the equation by getting out of the joint and doing a tenodesis if you have to treat your biceps. Whereas the younger people who have a clear instability injury just get a slap tear. Um, here's a video, no sound, but I'm just going to quickly walk you through it, right? So, you know, the reason I showed this is because physios, GPs need to understand what we do sometimes. You know? And a slap tear is very easy, There's nothing complicated about it. It's like stitching, right? You can put things back together. Surgery isn't complicated, right? What is complicated about the biceps and how you treat it is actually decision making. Who to fix, who not to fix. And when you're talking about poor outcomes in surgery, in shoulder surgery, poor outcomes are completely related to bad decision making, right? You can have a really, really good, you can drive a car really, really fast like Formula One, or you can drive it like a maniac really fast and crash it, right? So decision making is important. Now here is, if I can pause this video, sorry, one second. Here is a view that I'm going to show you inside the shoulder. So we're looking from the back, and what we're looking at is the, here we are, that is, that's the view that we want to show you, okay? This is a view looking from the back where you have the LHB, which is the long head of the biceps, coming out, 
you have the anterior leading edge of the supraspinatus right there, and just below there is the subscapularis, and of course the humeral head. And you can see this biceps goes up and down, but what it doesn't, what you shouldn't do is go back and forth like a windscreen wiper. Sometimes you have a slap tear, like this jab has, and the tendons are completely fine. But once sometimes, and other times when you have a slap tear, the base is so unstable, the bicep starts flicking back and forth, and it can start damaging the tendon. So how you treat the biceps, even for a slap tear, really, really depends on what the cuff is looking like. In this particular case, the cuff was perfectly fine. So we went ahead and fixed the slap tear. There's a lot of debate at the moment whether or not a, a biceps tenodesis adversely affects the functionality of the shoulder, as in what does the biceps do in the functional shoulder? Correct. Keeps, keeps humeral head depressed and, uh, and whatnot. So, Absolutely. Some people, I think, are trying to come away from it, but I think, once again, it depends on the decision, the, the decision whether or not the unstable biceps is affecting the cuff. To, to do a, a tenodesis just for pain and some simple discomfort, I suppose that's probably not such a great Correct. idea. So we, we, most cases of biceps are non-operative, right? Injections work really well, even if a steroid injections are on. Rehab is the key, right? Getting your shoulder stable so that the biceps is not, you know, so when your glenomal joint is stable and is rocking back and forth, the biceps is the first thing the human head hits and gets inflamed. So controlling stability is very important. Um, but we want to keep and preserve things anatomically as much as possible. Right? If there's going to be compromise to, if you want to do surgery, if you need to do surgery, and if you want to decide between to save the rotator cuff or save the biceps, then always err towards saving the rotator cuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if you do need to do a tenodesis, you don't need to do it. People, in, if you're in France, people just cut it, carotenotomy. People tolerate this uh, quite nicely. It's a Popeye or the reverse Popeye sign. You can get, you can get some groove pain, but most of the time it's okay. Uh, but nowadays, doing a tenodesis takes five to ten minutes, right? Um, so we tend to do that. Now you can do it on top of the groove, mid groove, you know, right at the bottom of the groove. I tend to do it right at the bottom of the groove. You know why? Because the problem with the biceps can happen in the joint, on top of the joint, in the groove. So I take potential all things out of the equation and make sure I do it right at the bottom of the groove so no issues can be biceps can be left behind. And and doing a biceps is actually pretty easy, right? Again, you know, we probably do this two or three times a day when we need to, often with rotator cuff surgery. I've cut the biceps already and I'm delivering the denotomized biceps through the incision. Um, and Nunu always wants to be in the camera, so he always smiles, right? Um, and once you've delivered it, um, we whip stitch it up, pretty similar to what we would do with the distal biceps, right? In fact, the techniques are very, very similar. Um, and it's a nice, strong hold. And once we've done it, we put a, um, a guide pin through, bicortically, just like we do distally. And then using a button, we flip it onto the far side. And this is this is me testing it, you know, just to make sure it's strong. The reason for showing this again to uh, somebody rehabbing it is by doing an endo button technique, it is so predictable compared to what we used to do before as anchors, is you can mobilize these patients straight away. 10 years ago, I was just say no active flexion, no active supination for six weeks. Now it's like, they come back a week later, I said, can you supinate, can you flex, go for it. Right, Absolutely. and and that is a real, real benefit to some of the <clears throat> new modern fixation techniques. To summarize, we tend to do slab repairs when there's no other biceps pathology or cuff pathology. Location of the tenodesis depends on the pathology, but all locations are fine depending on surgeons. But my preference is to do subpectoral with an endo button, as it's most predictable and reliable in my hands. It addresses all the biceps pathology and protects the rotator cuff. And lastly, history is the most valuable thing in the diagnosis. And examination is very helpful. But ultrasound, MRI scan, only useful for confirmation of your clinical suspicion and to rule out, as I say, the bad and the ugly in the shoulder to make sure nothing else is going on before you go in. And the last bit is most biceps pathology does not need surgery, but when it does, um, the decision making on what to do is quite important. 
So with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank Any you, questions? Um, I think it'd be really good if we have maybe yourself and Sharif just demonstrate some of those examination techniques. Yeah, sure. Um, the speeds yeah. of Brian's and so on. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that'd be right. I think that'd be, um, would everyone be happy with that? Yeah. And just on that final point, Ali said most biceps don't need surgery. So, so what do they need? They need us to deconstruct the problem and think about why the biceps is causing so much trouble. It's very often because the system isn't working well enough and a structure is being overloaded or asked to do too much work and causing pain and symptoms. So getting stability of the shoulder um, under control is extremely important. Otherwise, a bicep or another rotator cuff or, or the subacromial space will be under too much disc, uh, pressure and force and become reactive. So do you and how do you measure your shoulder strength, your rotator cuff strength, and how do you measure your shoulder stability? What else do you look at that contributes towards shoulder stability, such as the rest of the kinetic chain? So if it's an athlete that gets shoulder pain 30 minutes into their tennis game, for example, but you need to think, do they have endurance elsewhere? Or are their glutes failing and they're overcompensating with their shoulder, resulting in their biceps pain? So biceps pain is, biceps alone is usually not the culprit. So you need to look around the system locally and, and beyond to try and determine what is driving that irritation of the biceps. Totally agree.